60 Minutes with Angela starts right now. At his inauguration as governor and chief executive of Kaduna State in the northern part of Nigeria, my host today admitted that his state was in a bad situation. He became governor of a state that has the highest debt level per capita in Nigeria. In fact, the World Bank had rated it as the worst place to do business in Nigeria. In the first quarter of his tenure as governor, he reduced ministries from 24 to 13. He sacked a lot of permanent secretaries and even appointed non-indigents into what many called top positions in his government. On the debt situation, he says, and I'm quoting him now, from our estimates, every child born in Kaduna State has a debt of 15,000 Naira. If you have a child going to be born tomorrow, that child already has a debt burden of 15,000 Naira, and there are about 8 million people in Kaduna State. End of quote. Well, hello and welcome to the program. I'm Angela at Jetumobi. Kaduna State is in the northwest geopolitical zone of Nigeria. It was created on the 27th day of May 1967. It was carved out of the old northern region, previously known as North Central State, with its capital in Kaduna. With a land mass of 46,053 square kilometers, it has 19 natural resources. I stand to be corrected. Lawyer, author, and now governor of Kaduna State, Nasir El Rufai joins me now on the program. Thank you, Mr. El Rufai, for coming on the program with me today. It's my pleasure. Right. I want to take you back to inauguration and the situation you called difficult. What is the situation with the debt burden of your state today? Our debt burden continues to increase because in the short term when you are in a recession, the only way to get out is either to raise revenues internally and you cannot do that in the short term, mm. or borrow in the short term, hoping that in the medium to long term you raise revenues significantly to be able to pay back what you borrowed. We inherited a very bad situation uh, on a per capita basis. We are second highest indebted state at the time. Lagos had more debt but had greater capacity to pay back. Mm. We did not. But since then we've developed the capacity. We have doubled uh, our internally generated revenue collections. We've been rated B plus uh, by Fitch with positive outlook. We have a better rating, credit rating, than virtually any state in Nigeria. Uh, we have a better credit rating even than the federal government. So we have capacity to borrow now, but only to finance infrastructural development so that we create jobs and growth in our state with the certainty that the industries we are attracting, the jobs we are creating will enable the government raise enough internal generated revenue to pay back that debt. So we are borrowing more, but we are in a better position to borrow than the situation that we found ourselves. All right, let's start with ed education. You declared a state of emergency in that sector, and your priority was to provide free basic education in decent schools with skilled teachers. The only problem was you subsequently found that 60% of the teachers were not qualified to teach? No, 42%. 42%? Yes. All right. So how did you rectify that? 
Well, we have not fully rectified it. The dilemma of a, a investment in education is that it takes years before you begin to see the results. We had uh, f over 4,000 primary schools that were virtually all in a state of disrepair. Out of 4,254, only about 50 schools did not require any uh, wow. re repair in terms of uh, infrastructure. Many of the schools did not have enough toilets, many of the schools did not have water. So we had to work on the infrastructure track to try to you know, fix the schools to reduce congestion in the classrooms. We have done only 10% of the schools. We've only renovated over about 500 schools. But we have reviewed our strategy now. This year we are going to engage on a schools rebuilding program because we found that we're renovating already congested classrooms and that will not work. Particularly in the urban areas, we have uh, restrictions on land. So we have now decided to adopt a strategy of building multi-story classrooms on three, four floors so that we can take in more pupils in the same land. And uh, I'm happy to say that we've got the support of the World Bank. The World Bank just uh, approved uh, a credit of $350 million, one third of which will go towards their school's rebuilding program. We are going to rebuild 4,254 schools. Uh, so that will take care of the infrastructure. This will take a few years, yes. but we've started. The second leg is that, you know, education is not about school building. It's actually about the quality of teachers. Mm. A good teacher can make a child to be educated even under a tree. Yeah. So while having a comfortable classroom helps, the most important component of uh, school quality is teaching quality. Mm. And uh, when you have 42% of uh, uh, your teachers that are not qualified to teach, you have a serious problem. Happily for us, we inherited a situation in which a previous government had given all those teachers a timeline to be qualified, okay. otherwise they would lose their job. That deadline expired last year. And, and they didn't? The, many have not. So what we are doing right now is grading the teachers. All the primary school teachers, we have given them primary four exams. And anyone that fails to get at least 70% yes. in the primary four exam, we know is not qualified to teach. So they, they will be out. Right. And then we'll open the door to bring in young people, graduates. We want to employ graduates to teach in our primary schools. Mm. And we have hundreds and thousands of them yes. that are from Kaduna State that are interested in teaching, that need jobs. So we'll bring, in, we'll bring them in, put them through a teacher training program, crash program of teacher training and then deploy them to the classroom. So we are addressing that as well. Again, we've had a lot of support, not only from the World Bank, but also from the UK Department for International Development. Mm. The UK DFID has helped us with a teacher development program, while the World Bank has provided funding to train head teachers. We've trained over 12,000 head teachers on leadership skills. Mm. We've trained uh, nearly 25,000 teachers using the World Bank education credit. Yes. So we, we are making progress on that. And Kaduna State is doing well. We are the number one state in education in the northern in states. The north. We are 12th in rank in the country, mm -hmm. but we are number one in the north. We've beaten even those that used to be better than us, Kwara, Kogi, we've beaten them. We are much better than them. But that's not enough because a lot of our ranking came from the quality of our private schools rather than the public schools. And our goal is to bring back the quality of public schools. I went to a public school. I went to LEA Kao and Bariwa College. And Will I got you be compelling education. members of your government to ensure that their children attend public schools? Yes, it was a commitment we made during the campaign. We are not going to compel yes. uh, members of our government, but uh, we are, we've appealed to them to put their children in school. I am going to set an example by ensuring that once my youngest child now gets to the age of six, yes. he will get into a public primary school. And we have insisted, it's a condition, that all the directors in the Ministry of Education, directors, deputy directors, assistant directors, must have their children in our public schools. So we think we are on the right track as, as, as far as education is concerned, and yes. the results are clear. You know, when we was sworn in the number of pupils we have in our primary schools was 1.1 million. Yes. Today we have 2.1 million. Is that because you were offering a free school meal as well? Well, I, I think the, the most important incentive was making basic education free. We prohibited headmasters and principals from collecting any kind of levy. Uniform fee? No. 
for our secondary schools we provided uniforms for the primary schools parents we expect should provide uniforms but no other fees and uh, we then introduced primary school feeding program which we sustained throughout 2016 yes. we suspended it because we were expecting reimbursement of uh, about six to seven billion from the federal government which did not come through and we became overstretched so yes. we suspended it but the federal government has refunded us part of the money and we're negotiating to get the balance and we're looking at restarting now in september 2017 we expect to have about 2.5 million children in our primary schools in kaduna state and we are encouraged by that it means that our policies are working because the poor are bringing their children to school instead yes. of sending them to hawk bananas and so on yes. we've also passed a law criminalizing street hawking and begging. And any child in Kaduna State that is between the age of 6 and 15 must go to school. You don't have a choice. It's yeah. free and it's compulsory and you must go to school. Will you be arresting parents? We will be prosecuting parents that fail to sell their children to school. This has increased school enrollment and we are happy about that. Are we happy with the quality? Not yet. We are taking a number of measures to improve the quality particularly focusing on the teachers, as I said, yes. while improving the quality of infrastructure. I believe that we'll get there by God's grace. As, uh, with regards to secondary education, we have 345 secondary schools. Uh, so what we've done is to f first decide that we are going to make all our senior secondary schools boarding schools. Okay? We okay. believe that uh, having uh, young uh, children in boarding facilities bonds them, makes them understand one another, and enhances discipline. Oh, male and female students? Male and female students, okay. Um, and we've selected 15 schools yes. that are all secondary schools, like Barrio College, Government College, Kaduna, uh, Queen Amina College. These are old Rimi College. These are all schools, some as old as 60, 70 years, mm -hmm. uh, that have a history, and we're upgrading them and making them centers of excellence. And we're going to open up admission to these schools to every state in Nigeria for us to right. exchange students. students. Uh, we'll send our best uh, students, girls and boys, to these schools. And we expect other states to send their best students mm -hmm. to come so that we begin to build a Nigeria in which children learn to coexist and be tolerant of one another from a very young age. This yeah. was the idea of the federal uh, government colleges, and we want to uh, do something like that in Kaduna State. Yeah. Already there is an exchange program with the northern states, but we want to, you know, in, uh, you know, expand it beyond the northern states to the entire country. So we are working on that. So we, we, we are confident uh, that our educational policies and strategies are on the right track. But as I said, education investment is a generational investment. Mm -hmm. We will only begin to see uh, the results in a few years. All right. And the battle you had against those grabbing school lands, have you had much luck getting any of those lands back? A lot of luck. Uh, we've been getting all the land back. Yes. We have been uh, retrieving school and uh, uh, hospitals land across the state. Yeah. We have uh, the secretary to the state government leading that. Yeah. And uh, we started with Al Huda Huda College in Daria. We've gone around the state from primary to secondary schools. We are going into the School of Aviation because there has been a lot of encroachment of land on the School of Aviation. We are retrieving uh, illegally occupied land of Kaduna Polytechnic. So we are doing this and we are focused on it and we'll continue to do so. You were the first governor, as far as I know, in the class of 2015 to start the Treasury single account. You subsequently raised, I think, 24 billion from accounts you say you didn't know existed. I just thought 24 billion Naira, that's not change. 25 billion, actually. When the previous government handed over to us, yes. they reported that they had 7.8 billion in various bank accounts. When we took the decision to implement the Treasury single account, we sought the support of the Central Bank of Nigeria and the International Monetary Fund to give us technical support. And we wanted to do it in six weeks. They said it has never been done. It's impossible. The federal government has been trying to do it for three years. Yes. Without, but you know the federal government is huge. Kaduna State is very tiny. And we felt that it was possible to do it in six weeks. So we closed 470 bank accounts. And by the time we had all the credit balances in one central bank treasury single account, we had uh, about 25 billion. Subsequently, we found another 1.5 billion with a bank that didn't report the money. Yes. And uh, another bank uh, could not pay us back another 1.5 billion, which 
took time and central bank's intervention to get back the money and some assets. Mm. Uh, so in total, the TSA step uh, got us back nearly 27, 28 billion naira, not even the 25 we thought, because subsequent to that, we, yes. we, we you know, so, and we did it in less than six weeks. So it's, it's a world record. Now countries have come, some West African countries have come to study what Kaduna did. How were you able to do it? Because the IMF told them that these guys were able to do this in six weeks. Yes. So it, it is not impossible. And uh, we're very happy about it. Subsequently, we allowed the ministries, department and agencies to open bank accounts, but we know it's, control is limited. Uh, you cannot open a bank account unless the Commissioner of Finance approves. Yes. Uh, so we've kept the number of bank accounts small and manageable. So it is more difficult, you know, for leakages to happen. Mm. And we are, we are glad we did it. And uh, I'm happy that the federal government also, uh, you know, managed to complete its own long delayed process yes. to implement the TSA. It's something that every state government should do. And we're happy we, we, we did that very early. Mm. Let's talk about yourself and labor. Um, you have saved 500 million naira a month from your state's payroll verification process that you started. But when will we, if ever, see arrests and prosecution of these ghosts, or at least those behind the ghosts? Well, the, the thing is, if they are ghosts, you can't see and prosecute <laughs> them. Those that are behind it uh, are being tracked. We, after we concluded the verification at the state civil service level, and mind you, we are yet to conclude the local government verification. That has taken a much longer time because the records in the local governments are very poor very poor records. There are bigger problems in the local government human resource management system than anywhere. We commissioned Deloitte to do a forensic audit of state accounts to look at all these leakages. We commissioned another consultant business analytics to do an, the forensics of this uh, nominal and payroll. You know, we have suspects, we have people that we are going to go after and prosecute. But we, we, we haven't started yet, but we know where we are and uh, we are working on it and we will certainly prosecute them. Uh, most of them have left the system, you know, most have retired, most yeah. have, uh, most we got out when we came in, but it, there is no statute of limitations on crime. So <laughs> it doesn't matter how long it takes, we are going to come, go after them. Mm. Uh, but uh, what we are focused on now is do is completing the exercise in the local governments where as i said there are even bigger problems those problems have served to cripple the local governments most local governments can't do anything other than pay salaries yes. because a lot of their resources are stolen at the salaries level mm -hmm. so we are trying to conclude work on that and then the prosecutions will start by god's grace join us again after the break Hmm, nice question. Angela, that's a great question. It's a good question. It is difficult to respond to that question. That is a serious question. <laughs> Angela, that is a very great question. Great question, Angela. You know, Angela, that's a, that's a very difficult question. That's a great question, Angela. Okay, that's a great question. Angela, um, that's a tough one for me. That's a good question. Good question. 60 Minutes with Angela. Again, answers to every question you always wanted to ask. So what is 60 Minutes with Angela all about? It's not an interview. I like to think it's a conversation between two people, people making the news, people who are in the news, and those who become the news. And the whole idea is to inform, to educate, or to clarify, as the case may be. It is an art getting people to answer the questions that everyone is thinking in their minds. And that's what we try to do on 60 Minutes with Angela. I ask all the questions that everyone's thinking about and no one wants to voice. All the questions you always wanted to ask, you get those answers on 60 Minutes with Angela. Every week on this station, 60 Minutes with Angela, getting answers to every question you always wanted to ask. If you've just joined us, it's 60 Minutes with me, Angela Ajitumobi, on my hot seat today. The Governor and Chief Executive 
of Kaduna State in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, your quarrel with the Nigeria Labour Congress, or should I say NLC quarrel with you, on the verification form and the question of membership or non-membership of a trade union, you yeah. know. What is that all about? No, no. you see, what, what we found on ground in Kaduna was that from the salaries of teachers, for instance, yes. an amount is automatically deducted at source and remitted to the Nigerian Union of Teachers. We found similar arrangements for several other unions. Yes. And we checked the law, said, look, why is the state government acting as a collector for a non-governmental organization, for a mm. private entity? Because, I mean, with respect, trade unions are private entities. Yes. So why is the state government collecting on their behalf? What is our business? Trade unionism is voluntary. Yes. You know, you cannot start deducting, you cannot assume just because I am in the government and I'm a member of trade union. And what drew our attention to that was when one of our commissioners got part of his salary deducted <laughs> and remitted to a trade union. And certainly a commissioner is not a, member of, it's not a member of a trade union. So we began to interrogate this and we asked these questions. We couldn't get an answer. We sought the legal opinion of the Attorney General of the state who confirmed to us that trade unionism is voluntary and unless you indicate that you are a member of a trade union, no one should assume you are automatically one. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the question of automatic deduction is unlawful. Mm -hmm. So on the basis of that, we informed the NLC and yes. said, look, this is what we have found. But if you know a reason, a legal reason, or you know a provision of any law that we don't know, let yes. us know. And when we met with the NLC, they said, yes, there is a provision of the law that makes automatic deduction of check of dues lawful. I said, fine, let us have it. They couldn't produce it. So on the basis of that, when we're doing the verification, yes. we said, look, every employee should indicate by ticking a box, I'm a member of this trade union, so that we know that your payroll will automatically include a deduction. A deduction. Yes. Of course, the trade unions kicked because they know that most people will not want to give money just like that. I told them when I met with them that, look, it's up to you to convince workers that there is value in being members of a trade union. Yes. You can't just... Compel them. You, just, you can't compel them. Mm -hmm. If they see value, if they see you fighting for their rights, really, yes. rather than taking care of yourselves, they will be members of a trade union. But you can't, you know, you can't ask the state government to be your debt collector. <laughs> and uh, so that was the, 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 the disagreement we had, but yes. the law was on our side. And um, by the time the verification was done, the NLC and TUC were shocked that a significant majority of the civil servants in Kaduna chose to tick that they are members of a trade union. and mm -hmm. uh, But some, of course, opted out and yes. they are not being subject to deduction. Certainly all our commissioners are not members of a trade union, so mm -hmm. they cannot uh, be contributing to the to trade union coffers. So that was resolved. I, it was uh, simply, you know, the government taking the position of the law on the one hand and the NLC preferring a position of convenience on the other on hand. The other and hand. Uh, at the end, we, we didn't have any problem understanding each other. And the, the nightmare scenario that all, every employee of Kaduna State would not want to be a member of a trade union did not materialize. It didn't happen. Uh, they thought we had an agenda to discourage people from being members of a trade union, but we yes. didn't. We didn't care. Yes. We just wanted to give them the choice which is their right under the Constitution. And on pollution, World Health Organization report on world's most polluted cities. Yes. <laughs> Kaduna is fifth, yes. Aba is sixth, uh, Umahia 16th, Onicha is first, yes. uh, and worst for air pollution when measuring. I mean, what are you going to do about that? I was shocked when I got uh, those statistics and um, I mean when I walk around Kaduna I do not feel that the air is polluted. Yes. I did not think that my life was at risk. But when we got that report we interrogated our environmental protection agency to see what's going on. And uh, they said yes, our air quality is not the best. You know, we have lots of pollutants. The refinery is one of the biggest pollutants. We have the refinery in Kaduna. Yes, we have the refinery in Kaduna, whose uh, waste management systems are not the best. Mm. Okay, apart from air pollution, there is also a lot of ground pollution and so on. So we are talking to the authorities about that. We are talking to the NNPC and, and others. Uh, but one of the issues that came up that contributed to the air quality deterioration was the burning of waste pure water bags mm. that Sashes. get burnt and so on. 
and uh, we task our Ministry of Environment and the, Envi the Environmental Protection Agency to hire experts yes. to look at what steps we need to take to improve our air quality. How do we read Kaduna of plastic bags? And uh, they, they, they have commissioned experts, they are working on that, and we'll soon have a strategy that we're going to implement to improve this. It was quite scary, you know, when I got that information. Mm -hmm. I was worried about it. I felt mm -hmm. like running and coming back to Abuja <laughs> where I thought I'd be The air is cleaner. Yeah, where the air is cleaner. But we're working on it, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, whether the statistics are correct or wrong, we don't care. Yes. Once our environmental protection agency confirmed to us that there is a problem, we have decided we are going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Have we done anything about it? Other than re reaching out to the sources of pollution, we have done little. Yes. But we are soon going to unfold a comprehensive strategy to address it by God's grace. I want to quote something to you that you said. We took certain steps and told them that there is a new governor who is Fulani like them and has no problem paying compensation for lives lost, and he's begging them to stop killing. I'm sure you saw the reactions uh, to that <laughs> statement when you made it. You know, talk us through what is going on in the state. You know, there are allegations that you favor one religion over another. A lot of people who know you say, that is so wrong about the kind of person that you are. Yeah, well, look, unfortunately, the politics of Kaduna State is steeped in religion. It has served uh, previous governments very well. Mm. And the political culture in Kaduna is that everything you say or do is yes. looked at through a religious lens. I would be judged by that, but that judgment may not be right. Uh, as you said, those that know me or those that look around me will know that religion matters little to me. I believe that religion is a very personal thing and uh, when it is time for prayers, I leave a group, I go and pray. I don't compel anyone to pray, I don't care. Uh, there are people I've worked with for years without ever knowing what religion they practice. That's how I am, that's who I am. I really th believe that everyone will face God in his grave alone, yeah. Yeah. so you have no business compelling any other person either to practice your religion or even to practice his religion. Yeah. It's his business. You know, this is a fundamental belief of mine due to my upbringing and the environment in which I was brought up. You know, in Kaduna, even if you, you know, I, I said this somewhere and I, I think many people found it strange, but it's true. In Kaduna, if you invite three people and say, let's have lunch, there will be a religious connotation to it. You know, and religion has become a convenient way to hide behind mm -hmm. and commit crimes. Now, in our state, over the last 37, 38 years, we've had repeated cycles of violence between communities that use religion and ethnicity as the facade. I say a facade because I grew up in Kaduna town. I went to school in Kaduna. I went, I went to primary school in Kao, Kaduna. I went to secondary school in Zaria. And this was not the Kaduna I knew. Okay, the Kaduna I knew was very cosmopolitan. You have one Christian living next to a Muslim and then another Christian. We used to enjoy Christmas and Easter with the same gusto that we enjoyed Idil Fitila and Idil Kabir. We yeah. enjoyed going to one another's homes. This was not the Kaduna I grew up. The Kaduna I came back to was a divided city across the river because religion has become, in, you know, manipulated into everything. Yeah. Now, to change that, we needed to take certain steps that were drastic, that were difficult, that would not please anyone. While some are trying to sell the narrative that I favor Christian, that I favor Muslims, yeah. in the mosques, some are preaching against me saying that I favor Christians. You know, when both sides accuse you, you know yeah. you're on the right track. So I sleep very well at night. I don't care about all those. And my conscience is very clear. I am driven by facts and logic in my decision making. Mm -hmm. And I always try to get our cabinet, my team of uh, advisors to use facts and logic, not sentiments, in making decisions because we were elected by the entire state. We won in every senatorial district, including the areas that were that are considered Christian. We, we you know I defeated the PDP in Southern Kaduna. And before the election P PDP was boasting that PDP is in the blood of Southern Kaduna people. I got 56% of the vote there. So I defeated them. So for that reason, we must treat everyone evenly. But let me tell you where the problem lies. Yeah. The problem lies in three historical realities. The first historical reality is that from 1980 
Till 2016, Kaduna State has suffered repeated cycles of violence in which Muslims kill Christians, Christians kill Muslims, one ethnic group kills another, repeatedly, without anyone being brought to justice. So a culture of impunity has set in, has set in and people believe that whenever there is an outbreak of violence, you can kill your neighbor, you can destroy his property and nothing happens afterwards. We read nearly a dozen commission of inquiry reports in which these incidents were investigated, people identified, and they all follow the same pattern. An argument between a Muslim and Christian becomes a communal conflict. Yeah. Curfew is imposed after people are killed and property destroyed. And then a commission of inquiry is established, it studies the situation, calls witnesses, lists those that committed crimes and tasks the police to investigate and prosecute them, the report is put in the drawer, end of story, and we wait for another cycle. And in some of the cases, the same names have, uh, have, yeah. have appeared in two, three commission of inquiry reports without any consequence. So that's the first reality. When you inherit a state with that kind of impunity, yeah. where people believe that nothing happens when I kill someone, when I destroy his property, you have a serious problem. And what is the facade behind which all this crisis happen and how people get away with it after the fact? They use religion. They hide behind, you know, if the, uh, the governor is a Muslim and he tries to prosecute Christians, oh, he's prosecuting, he's persecuting Christians. Yeah. If the governor is a Christian, he tries to go after Christians, churches will be saying, you are going after your own brothers. Oh. And vice versa. This, this, is, this has been what has happened. We've studied this, we understood it. So we knew we had to do something different, that's one. Secondly, one of the worst cycles of violence we've had in the history of the state was the 2011 post-election violence. You remember what happened? There was violence all across the northern state, but the Kaduna state violence was the worst. And the area where the most people were killed were, were, was in southern Kaduna, in which over 800 people were killed. This is, in human this is in reports of Human Rights Watch. Yes. This is in reports of the Commission of Inquiry by the Kaduna State Government, as well as the federal government, the Lemu Report. If you read it, everything is there. Kaduna State was the worst, and Southern Kaduna was the worst. Now, what happened was, in April, pastoralists were moving their cattle back to where they came from, some of them from outside Nigeria. And they were caught. They were just inadvertent victims of circumstance. They were passing by. They were Fulanese, they had cattle, they were passing through southern Kaduna and they were trapped, they were killed. The government set up commissions of inquiry, Lemu recommended compensation to be paid, federal government provided money to pay compensation for those affected, many received compensation. But the pastoralists, the transhumans pastoralists as they are called, the Fulanese from other African countries that passed through Nigeria and yes. were going back when this happened, of course, could not claim compensation because they are not resident here. They don't have an address. Yes. They don't even have a name. Nobody knew them. But those whose relations were killed know that they were killed and they know where they were killed. And the Fulanis have a culture of vengeance. If you kill my relation, even if it takes 100 years, I will settle it. It's the, it's the culture. I'm not saying it's a good culture. I'm not saying it's a bad culture. It's, it's their it's culture. It it's what it is. It's a reality we have to deal with. Now, when this happened in 2011, Governor Patrick Yakowa, of blessed memory, realized when southern Kaduna communities were being attacked, he realized that there was something amiss. He realized that these attacks were not being carried out by locals within that. Mm. They were definitely outsiders, and he began to investigate, and he realized that they were coming from other West African countries. So he set up a team to reach out to these Fulanis in other countries and offer them compensation for cattle lost and lives lost, rather than them coming in to avenge Revenge. what happened. Yes. Because you are killing people just because they happen to be in an area where your relation was killed. Maybe mm. these people were innocent of what happened. Why are you going to, you know? So Yakua started that process, and by, before he died, by the middle of 2012, the killings had stopped. Because he started sending delegations to explain, to apologize, and offer compensation. When he died, the government that succeeded him yes. stopped this process, and the killings resumed. Now, I was sworn in on Friday 29th of May by 10 a.m. By 5 p.m., a community in Sangha was attacked and five people were killed. So my very first duty as governor of Kaduna State was yes. to call an emergency security council meeting on Saturday to be briefed on what happened and to know what we are going to do. Because the security council members have been sitting there for years, so yes. I thought they would know something we don't. Yes. And this is what, how we began to try to understand the problem 
and we then set up the Agwai Commission Committee to look into this problem, and they came back with similar findings that Yakoa found in 2011. They found that a lot of these attacks on communities in southern Kaduna were coming from outside Nigeria, and we needed to reach out to such people and stop them from coming. Yes. So we resuscitated the Yakoa Committee and sent them out to go there and say, look, stop this because there is a new government, there is a new governor. If that happened under Yakoa, the new governor is even a full animal like you. Yes. And he is offering an olive branch. Stop it. What do you want? Do you want to be compensated for any cattle lost or lives lost? We'll do it. But stop killing our people. That's what I said. But what came out was that, ah, Erufai is paying Fulani herdsmen to kill. This whole thing was twisted. And I have faced all those that said that. I said, look, the payment of, of, of compensation for lives and property is rooted in the, in the Bible. It's rooted in the Quran. So what is so wrong about that? Is it because we are stopping the killings? We should allow them to come so and continue. That? So that was the second problem that we had to address. And we knew that unless we address that problem and isolated the conflict to Nigeria, mm. we'll never find a solution. And happily, we have more or less contained that. As we were putting that to rest, yes. we had a domestic conflict, which is related to the first issue that I pointed out to you, because this has happened over and over, no consequences, you know. And thereafter, political actors, particularly PDP, uh, people in Kaduna, Southern Kaduna, saw an opportunity to gain relevance. So they were buying arms, they were pouring money, they were pouring drugs to escalate the crisis. Because they thought it will make me look bad, it will bring back relevance to them, and, uh, you know, it will give the impression that, ah, you know, a Fulani Muslim governor is watching while Christians are getting killed and they put a lot of money in media, Southern Kaduna genocide, all that crap. We did not overreact. We felt that security is not done on the pages of newspapers. We'll just try to contain the situation, bring it under control. We'll go after those mm. that started the crisis or exacerbated it or invested in it. And we are coming after them. We refuse to set our commission of inquiry because there is nothing new to learn. We impose curfew, we militarize the place. Now Southern Kaduna is quiet. And we went after those that are purveyors of hatred and violence. Those that use fake news, put pictures of wanton genocide on yeah. Twitter to say that this is Southern Kaduna to get him. We went after them. We arrested some of them. Now they are more circumspect about what they post. They cross check before they rush to do this. I may be accused of high-handedness, but I cannot sit back, as the governor of Kaduna said, and allow irresponsible behavior mm. by anyone, whether you're a journalist or a private individual, you go and put something that leads to the killing of others, and you tell me that's your freedom of speech, you are free to have your freedom of speech. But I also have the responsibility to prosecute for hate speech and all that. And we are doing that. And we do not care what people say. We brought peace back to southern Kaduna. We are now at the second phase, which is prosecution, we'll yes. soon be prosecuting very important people. We've been watching them, we've been documenting them, we've had the support of the security agencies to build a case against them, we are going to bring them before a judge. The judge said they have done nothing, fine, but we are going to go after them. The yes. days of impunity are over in Kaduna State. And, you know, if you say I'm prosecuting because you're a Christian, fine. You're a criminal, you're not a Christian. <laughs> if you say I'm, prosecute, I'm, I'm prosecuting you because you're a Muslim, yeah. fine. I don't care. I'm prosecuting because you committed a crime. And it is my constitutional responsibility to do so, not because you're a Muslim. I don't care if you're a Muslim. We are prosecuting the members of the IMF, al uh, people. Yeah, the people. They are Muslims. I'm a Muslim, but they have committed a crime. And I took the Quran and promised that anyone that violates the laws of Kaduna will be prosecuted. No one is exempted. Even my son knows that if he commits a crime, it will happen to him. <laughs> so this is what we are trying to do. Yes. In Kaduna, of course, will not, not everyone will be happy. Many people have an agenda. But our only agenda is the progress of Kaduna state and the unity and peaceful coexistence of the state and creating an environment in which every Nigerian will find Kaduna state a place that he can call his home without discrimination. This is our goal. This is what Kaduna used to be. And this is the glory and the greatness of Kaduna we are working to restore. Join us again after the break. 
Hmm, nice question. Angela, that's a great question. It's a good question. It is difficult to respond to that question. That is a serious question. <laughs> Angela, that is a very great question. Great question, Angela. You know, Angela, that's a, that's a very difficult question. That's a great question, Angela. Okay, that's a great question. Angela, um, that's a tough one for me. That's a good question. Good question. 60 Minutes with Angela. Again, answers to every question you always wanted to ask. Welcome back. My concluding moments now with the Governor and Chief Executive of Kaduna State, Malam Nasir El Rufai. You ordered the immediate arrest of all signatories to statements issuing that three month ultimatum to all Igbos to leave northern Nigeria. The deadline for that ultimatum was the 1st of October. Has anyone been arrested? They have not been arrested because they are out of jurisdiction. They have all run out. They came to Kaduna. Well, to be quite honest, they are not from Kaduna State. Yes. But they were assembled by some politicians, funded, to come to Kaduna because Kaduna is the capital of the old Northern Protectorate and the Northern Region. Mm. So everything you want to do that has to do with Northern Nigeria, you come to Kaduna. They came to Kaduna and issued that ultimatum. For me, yes. the issue of that ultimatum was a direct challenge to the sovereignty of Nigeria and the fact that there is a government in Kaduna State. How can a bunch of irresponsible, unelected, unknown people come and threaten another Nigerian within the territory in which we are elected to govern. And some of what they said amounted to hate speech. It is the same as posting those Rwandan genocide pictures on Twitter. And we arrested people for that. So how can we not arrest these people? I was not even in the country. It was my team that met and decided that this had to be done. They just called me while I was in the Netherlands and said, we are going to do this. I said, of course, you have to. We don't have a choice. Mm. And we are, go we are going after them. They have all gone underground. I read in the news that one of them was saying he's ready to be arrested. Please, he should come to Kaduna, go to the commissioner of police, because what, the handcuffs are waiting. He will be arrested, he will be arraigned, and the judge will decide his fate. If they are not cowards, they should come back to Kaduna and report themselves to the commissioner of police and they will be prosecuted. If they are sure of the rightness of their action, they should do that. But we cannot accept a situation in which one Nigerian will threaten another within a geographic uh, uh, boundary that we govern and we keep quiet. Yes. Some people have said, yeah, but when the Igbos were doing this, you didn't say a word. I'm not the governor of Anambra or Imo state. I'm the governor of Kaduna state. Whatever happens in Anambra or Imo or any of the states is the responsibility of the governors there. And if they don't act, is there a, is, you know, you talk to them, not yes, me. Yes. If you come to Kaduna and you break the law, it is my duty to apply the law. And I will not, by, with, with the greatest respect, live by the standard of others. Yes. There is an objective standard, which is the constitution and the law. That's what I live by. And the fact that others are not doing what they should do does not make it right yes. for me to allow that kind of thing. So, to the area where you issue the ultimatum, I beg of you, come to Kaduna, go and report to the commissioner of police and have your day in court. We believe in the rightness of our actions. We believe that this kind of behavior should not be condoned anywhere in Nigeria. And we intend to ensure that we, we, we enforce that in Kaduna state. That's all we can do. We cannot enforce it in Kaduna state. We cannot enforce it in any other state. But within Kaduna, we will not accept anyone to come and say or do things that have the potential of breaching the peace. We will not accept it. We will act. I've interviewed you twice before, 2011 and 2012, as a civilian. And today, I'm still a civilian. <laughs> what would you say has been a defining moment for you, transitioning from an activist and author into being a governor? Is there anything <laughs> different? Do you, is it difficult to govern? It is incredibly difficult to govern. I have been in government before. I have administered the federal capital territory. So in a way, it, it is not entirely new to me. But even with my previous experience in running the FCT, which is more or less a governor's role, subordinated to the president, obviously, I have found the governors of Kaduna State incredibly difficult. I complained to some of my colleagues, senior governors, that you guys didn't tell us this was difficult. I would have refused, you know. Of course, uh, you know, I don't know whether I would, I would be able to refuse President Buhari because he yeah. called me and said, go and run for governor of Kaduna State. Yeah. That was an order, and yeah. I just had to do it. I wasn't prepared for it, 
but I had to start preparing to do so. Mm. But it's a very difficult job, you know, particularly in the circumstances we found ourselves yeah. of uh, resource shortages and high expectations and so on. The transition was not very difficult, as I said, but the size and multiplicity of the issues in Kaduna, you know, make the job very, very difficult. Yeah. And in fact, the biggest game changer, in my opinion, the biggest difference between Kaduna and Abuja is this issue of ethnicity and religion. This was totally absent in, the, in, Abuja. in, the, in Abuja because, yeah. you know, everybody is here and nobody will claim to be indigenous or settler and all that. But Kaduna has a lot of those little petty things yes. that can serve to distract. And we have tried our best to try to remain focused and to bring back everyone on focus on what is important, which is Nigeria is better united moving in the same direction. Kaduna is better, stronger, united moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. These divisions don't help anybody. Yeah. And, and you've, you've done a bit, you know, working on religion, replacing the religious regulation edict of 1984, mm -hmm. a law which many did admit that had never been implemented. Yes. Uh, so I was thinking perhaps people were used to that fact that it wasn't going to be implemented and were wondering why you were focusing on that edict now. Well, you know, as I said, because, you know, I, I think the biggest source of division in Kaduna State yes. is the fake use of religion. And uh, in my opinion, the best way to neutralize that is to bring everything out. Let there be very clear guidelines and regulations for conduct of preachers. Because once upon a time, before you preach in a, in a church, you have to go to seminary. To learn. To learn. Mm. And then you come out and you deputize a pastor for years to learn. So you go through a process of education and training before you are handed over a congregation. But today, you know, a drug addict today will say that, yes, you know, yesterday God has spoken to him and he is a bishop. You have no way of knowing whether he's telling the truth because God has not told you one way or the other. So that's in Christianity. In Islam, the same thing. Yeah. Before you are allowed to lead congregation in a mosque, you have to go through process of memorizing the Quran, learning the fiqh and uh, hadith, and you know. Then you train under a senior cleric, and gradually you will be given the opportunity to call for prayer, mm -hmm. the adhan. And then you'll become what they call naibi, the deputy to the imam, for years before you are accredited to be an imam. But today, anyone can just go and build his small mosque and uh, start preaching without the necessary training or education. And this has led us to have metazine, to have boko haram, and so on and so forth. This is all because religion is not being regulated. There is nowhere in the world. Where religion is not regulated. Mm. Even in Saudi Arabia, the root of Islam, yes. there is a ministry of religious affairs and work that has to recognize you and license you before you preach, before you lead prayers. So we believe that the religious preaching edict of 1984 needed to be revised, updated to 21st century because there are new modes of communication. For instance, that edict said you cannot play a religious tape after midnight to, yeah. and disturb your neighbors for instance today we have cd we have usb there are many ways of reproducing audio mm. so we felt it needed to be updated and the edict provided for five years of imprisonment without option of fine we thought that was too stiff so we reduced it to two years with an option of fine because you have to give a person a chance to reform okay you 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 break the law once you are taken before a judge mm. the mere fact of standing before a judge humbles a person, yes. reduces the likelihood that he will want to do it again. Mm -hmm. So we felt, you know, let's democratize this a little bit. And, you know, and we sent it to the House of Assembly. All hell let loose. Christians were saying, I'm against uh, Christianity. Muslims were saying, I'm against Islam. And I'm saying, yes, I must be right. And uh, the law is yet to be passed by the State House of Assembly. They have not been able to do so. It's been with them since... October 2015, they have not been able to pass it because they are, they are scared, you know, they, they, they are being intimidated and threatened by, by both sides. But it's a law that is needed. And two months after we sent the law to the House of Assembly, we had the problem with the El Zagzaki movement, you know, just blocking a public highway and saying the chief of army staff should not pass through. Yeah. That brought to the fore what happens 
when you allow anyone, because Alex Zaki was in university with me, he was an economic student. He was not even studying religi uh, religious uh, studies. He was an economics undergrad. I was a quantity survey undergrad, and we are both active in the Muslim society. It is from there he became a cleric. How? When? So, and you know, unless Nigeria as a country addresses this fundamental issue, that you cannot allow people to have free reign just because they mention religion. Mm -hmm. We continue to have crisis. Thank you very much, Governor El Rufai, for coming back on the program with me. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. I'm Angela Ajitsumovic. <laughs>